Malaysia and also for uh, uh, the speaker tonight for Osman Bakar and the uh, rest of my colleagues all over the world. We have uh, for Osman, we have 87 participants or 88 now and we have this uh, brother as far as uh, brother Farhad from Toronto, Canada. Uh, he visited you in East Tech. So before I introduce Prof. Sambaka and make uh, some introduction, why don't we begin the, our uh, session tonight with recitation Al-Fatiha. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Summa, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have GPIT uh, online intellectual discourse series number 22. After we have uh, a break for two months, now we start with number 22 and we have prominent scholars with us, Professor Datu Osman Baka, and uh, we'll discuss uh, on Al Ghazali uh, and Ibn Rush, two stars in the intellectual galaxy of Islam. So, and we're fortunate to have our own star with us, Professor Osman Bakar himself. And before I start, I will introduce, I will uh, uh, make an introduction for who's Al Ghazali. And uh, of course, Professor Osman, Osman will elaborate more. The famous 11th and 20th uh, centuries. 12th century Al Ghazali was the first occupant of the chair of Shafi'i law at the leading Nizamiya University in Baghdad, which at the time was the archival of Al Azhar. And Ibn Rush himself, better known as a competitor of Aristotle, was credited with several medical works, including medical encyclopedia entitled or Book of Generalities of Medicine. He also wrote commentaries of Ibn, Sina, Ibn Sina medical works. And both of Ibn Rush and Al Ghazali acknowledge the importance of Al Quran as an essential guide for anyone who wants to live a meaningful and fulfilling and productive productive life. And uh, before I would like to invite Professor Mbaka, I would like to introduce. Uh, of course, we, everybody knows we have 113 participants, Prof, uh, currently with us all over the world, from Canada, Africa, Cambodia. Uh, uh, Indonesia and uh, all over the world and uh, now um, an honor to for me to introduce Professor Dato Dr. Swambaka, a distinguished professor at uh, uh, East Tech International Islamic University of Malaysia he was Al Ghazali Chair of Epistemology and Civilizational Studies uh, he was formerly Director of Sultan Omar Ali Al Saifuddin Center of his science studies at Nusi Brunei Darussalam. He's, he's concurrently emeritus of Professor of Philosophy of Science, Nusi Malaya Kuala Lumpur. He has published 22 books and over 300 articles on Islamic thought and civilization, particularly on Islamic philosophy and science. He also writes on contemporary Islam and interreligious and inter-civilizational dialogue. His writing has been translated into many languages. He has served as advisor and consultant to a variety of international academic and professional organizational institutions, including UNESCO and Qatar Foundation. He served as Deputy Vice Chancellor of Islamia 1995, year 2000. He was included in the list of 500 most influential Muslims in the world in 29 and 2012. Without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Osman Baka, the virtual world is your floor. The father of Prof. Thank you, Brother Professor Fauzan, the moderator. Uh, Brother Shaharan, uh, Temple IT, uh, East Asia, and uh, all friends uh, from various parts of the world. Uh, I give you all assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam sejahtera, peace be unto you, 
Of course, depending on where you are, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. Thank you to Triple IT for inviting me to uh, give this um, short um, uh, lecture. The, let me explain to you the background of this um, uh, lecture. Um, some time ago, it was, I think, um, Professor Fauzan who forwarded an article uh, from Pakistan. Yes. Uh, it was an article in which the writer um, talks about the uh, how in sense the, the, the difference between Al Ghazali uh, and Ibn Rush as author, the author taking the side uh, refer to the controversy uh, between the two figures and uh, he took the side of uh, Ibn Rush criticizing on the other hand uh, Al Ghazali as someone who was responsible uh, for uh, the decline of science and uh, intellectual life in Islam. Uh, and because of that um, article, I made some comments. And then I think um, some of the members of the another uh, group, uh, WhatsApp group, uh, thought that it might be a good thing if um, a lecture be held on the subject because there's so much um, uh, misunderstanding, so much um, uh, misconception, and also uh, the false, basically, uh, uh, things that are not factual about uh, the history of Islamic thought. So I took up the, the offer uh, by Triple IT to make this, to, 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 to give this lecture. And um, of course, um, uh, once you know, agreeing to talk about these two, uh, how should I phrase uh, the topic? So I came up with this uh, topic, um, Al Ghazali and um, Ibn Rush, <coughs> two stars, two stars in the intellectual galaxy or the intellectual uh, uh, intellectual legacy, um, galaxy of of Islam. Uh, the idea, the and this was um, uh, deliberate on my part why I use those terms. Uh, first, of course, when to use the word galaxy, um, I could have uh, make it um, uh, smaller in scope, talks about the universe, but I thought make it even uh, bigger, uh, so as to embrace uh, more things, more diverse things um, within uh, the uh, Islamic uh, history itself. Uh, because um, uh, basically, the, the idea is that um, I would like to accept, I would like to accept both of them uh, as um, two important uh, figures in Islamic intellectual history and not just question of uh, saying that um, uh, I'll be, I would like to choose um, either one, uh, but, as, but that is, does not correspond to the a true reality uh, in Islamic intellectualism. Now, that was the, the background uh, of this uh, lecture. Now, the, we know very well that the religion of Islam as uh, contained in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, created a large intellectual universe, universe of ideas. Since the beginning of the region until now, after more than 14 centuries, especially during those uh, periods, the centuries when uh, we used to call Islam at its best, when Islam was at its best, when Islam was its most creative phase of its history, um, Islam produced uh, many intellectual figures, many thinkers, many scholars. Uh, and uh, certainly now we have with us Al-Ghazali uh, and Ibn Rush, 
uh, not simply two stars, but two of the brightest stars in the intellectual galaxy of, of Islam. Um, yes, there were similarities between them, a lot of similarities. In fact, there are more similarities between them than that divide, uh, that divide them. Uh, but the way some people among both Muslims, as well as those from outside in the West, for example, um, who like enough want us to make a choice, either Al Ghazali or Ibn Rush. Uh, but my uh, approach is that both of them belong to the religion of Islam, and both of them believe in the Quran, believe in the Sunnah believe in the principle of uh, ijma consensus as a source uh, of, of, of knowledge, a concept which um, Ibn Rush uh, referred to when he wanted to respond to those uh, who want to uh, doubt the, the philosophers of which he, thought he, was, he was one as um, uh, opposed against Islam, as going against Islam, uh, you know. Uh, especially those who want to, in, 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 of course, include reference to Al Ghazali. Uh, he, he tried to bring that idea that uh, there's no consensus on that. When it comes to doctrines, uh, you can there's no consensus that the philosophers were, uh, you know, outside the fold uh, of Islam. So, uh, what I'm to say now here, because we study the universe, the intellectual universe, Islam was so large, there's bound to be a lot of diversity. You cannot expect in, within such a, a large intellectual universe to find uniformity of thought. What is important is whether the ideas, the thoughts uh, which, which were had, which were in, in sense emphasized by each of the two thinkers were contrary to the Quran and the Sunnah or not. Well, my life devoted to Islamic philosophy, Islamic Islamic thought, I didn't see that way. Yeah? Uh, I saw both of them as being true ulama. They were true ulama, they were real ulama in the sense and real sense of the word. In the sense that people uh, oh. who have uh, knowledge, deep knowledge, the people, uh, the, the two who knew very well. Um, the Quran, who knew very well, the Sunnah, who knew very well, also the history of um, pre-Islamic civilization, especially the Greek uh, civilization. So the, yeah, it is important to, 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 to take note of that. In fact, if you look at the two, they were both trained in the religious sciences, the sciences of the Sharia. They were trained also uh, but in different ways, uh, trained in that they were exposed to uh, in the uh, intellectual sciences, what uh, has been uh, familiarized in Islam, what we call the uh, Nakli sciences or the uh, Al Ulum, Al Nakliya, the transmitted sciences, basically coinciding uh, at the core, which basically is the sciences of the Sharia. And then you have also the other branch, the major category of the sciences, what uh, we call the uh, intellectual sciences or the rational sciences, referring to the Al Ulum and Al uh, So, both Al Ghazali or the Ghazali's um, earlier background uh, was the uh, sciences of the Sharia, the Nakli sciences, but later uh, he learned, uh, basically, he learned. The, the different philosophical sciences. Uh, not on the same uh, level as um, Ibn Rush, but in the case of Ibn Rush, um, same thing, he was uh, familiar uh, in both categories of sciences. Uh, he was also trained as, uh, in the, as I said, in the uh, sciences of the Sharia. Uh, he became the chief justice, um, chief Qadi in uh, Cordova, you know, and uh, he, uh, the, the, the moderator just now referred that uh, he was the great commentator of Aristotle. Um, but as I said, there are more things in common. 
than differences. But in Islamic intellectual, of course, I mean, we have many uh, different schools. We have schools, the legal school, Al Ghazali belong to the Shafi'i school, and Ibn Rush belong to the Maliki school. But they were knowledgeable in the Sharia. And uh, Al Ghazali, uh, of course, I mean, he, he was a, a, a theologian of the sense, the uh, belonging to the school of uh, Kalam, uh, one of the Mutakallimun. Uh, he belonged to the Asharite uh, school. Um, of course, in the case of uh, Ibn Rush, I mean, he, he does not belong to that school uh, because he belongs to the school of the uh, the philosophers, the philosophers, the peripatetic school, and the as uh, the Mashai school. The, 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 by mean by by which we mean uh, he belonged to the school of the uh, Muslim followers of uh, Aristotle. Aristotle has followers among Jewish and uh, uh, Christian philosophers, but uh, in among the Muslims, we have uh, Al Kindi, we have Al Farabi, we have uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rus. All these belong to the peripatetic school. But what distinguished um, Ibn Rus from the others because of his um, uh, of his rational stance? I think this is where really the misunderstanding, yeah? the misunderstanding that that because uh, he was a kind of rationalist, you know, uh, and therefore. Uh, he was against um, certain tenets of Islam, uh, but I don't find that I don't find that I don't find that the case. Uh, to me, yes, he was. Um, uh, he may be called a Muslim rationalist, uh, Islam uh, follower, exponent of Islamic rationalism. But we need to bear in mind that in the world of his time and even now. There were many schools of rationalism, um, and if and, and certainly it is legitimate to say that there is such a thing as Islamic rationalism, and um, and basically when we say rationalism, uh, it is we are dealing about ideas, beliefs, perspectives about the place and role of reason in our life and thought. And to say that, for example, Ibn Rus uh, was um, makes more makes use of uh, makes more use of reason, uh, you know, uh, than um, uh, more rational than um, uh, Al Ghazali. That would be uh, not entirely and entirely correct. But certainly, uh, Ibn Rus emphasized the use of reason. Uh, much more than Azali, or we can say that the philosophers emphasize emphasize the, the role of reason in a more um, in, in a wider scope uh, than say the, the Motakalimon. But um, that itself does not mean that one is um, uh, more Islamic uh, than the other. Uh, the and what's important to note that is within. The universe of Islam. What the principle that was maintained was the harmony between reason and revelation. No Muslim philosopher would say that reason stands above revelation. What you know? Um, the philosophers also maintain that revelation is superior to reason. But where they differ is basically is about the scope given to the use of reason. So in this respect, you can say that the philosophers emphasize the reason of, uh, in, in much more ways. So that, for example, the difference between Agazali uh, and Ibn Rush concerns um, the, the, the place of reason in atten the attainment of truth. So Ibn Rush emphasized that reason is the main Instrument emphasize much more, whereas Ghazali was talking also about the the other sources of truth apart from uh, from reason, a kind of uh, emphasizing the supra rational experience. Uh, for example, uh, 
on the organ, on the intellectual organ, or the cognitive organ of the pulp, the heart. In other words, the heart is another uh, cognitive organ that was emphasized. And in the case of Zeri uh, Depa, the emphasis, uh, you have to understand that context. The, 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 for example, the legitimacy, the, the rationale uh, for the purification of the soul or purification of the heart, precisely because um, that is a very important source uh, uh, to knowledge. So it's a question of emphasis of one um, over the other. Uh, and what, 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 and, and therefore here, when we uh, see uh, arguments or claims made uh, by some people within Islam, among, among Muslims, or um, uh, outside the fall of Islam from some thinkers in the West, making the choice, I think um, uh, uh, the, 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 the claims are made because uh, the, 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 uh, they do not really look at the total uh, picture of the thinking of these of these two of these two people. Uh, let's say, take for example, Agazali. Um, the, the thing is, Agazali, as the author of Tahafud al falasifa the incoherence of the philosophers, which they were nearly criticized, is not or was not the same Agazali, for example, who wrote. Um, Books, Munkis Min of Dalal, or who wrote um, uh, uh, Risala al uh, or Mishkatul Anwar. It's, it's too different, like Ghazali. Because uh, why was that so? Uh, this is something which we need to, to understand. The emphasis in traditional Islam was that, the, the, in the sense that intellectuals belong. On generally, not, not everybody, but, but okay, generally, of course there were exceptions, generally the intellectuals belong to a particular school and some belong to more than one school because uh, within themselves as a single individual, they um, they played different roles. They, I mean, let's say Al-Ghazali, uh, he was a fakir, he was a jurist, and not simply a jurist, an excellent one, uh, uh, no? uh, a formidable one. Then he was also, in other words, he, 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 he belonged to the school, the, the legal school, the legal scholar. But in terms of seeking truth, the truth, in terms of, you know, of, 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 of ideas, uh, three added schools were important. He was a mutakalim. In other words, he was a, a dialectical surgeon. So when he wrote Tafut al Falasifa, he wrote that work from the perspective of Kalam, not from the perspective of uh, Fek, not from the perspective of, well, of course, at the time when he wrote, it was, he, he did not study, you know, uh, when he wrote that book, of course, he would just learn philosophy, but uh, he was not really um, a full flesh Sufi, you say, not, not in the park, but he was a uh, mutakalimun, but he learned philosophy by himself, he did not have a teacher. Uh, in philosophy, but um, he understood philosoph philosophy, the practice philosophy, to the extent that he was able to produce uh, the, the maqasid al uh, falasifa, the, the aims of the uh, the purposes of the philosophers very well. He read very, very well. He understood that. Huh? Um, so he, he was, uh, but he, he wrote, or rather he wrote that book, that book, the Tafut uh, Falsifa, the incoherence of the of the philosophers as a mutakalim. Therefore, what so why is the perspective of this? It is basically um, to to defend. It's basically to defend the the beliefs, the ordinary the beliefs of the ordinary uh, believers uh, during because during that time we saw uh, the some of the uh, streams of ideas that. Um, you know, uh, among the philosophers who might be misunderstood, uh, who might mislead the ordinary believers. So that was, of course, was meant more to refute. It was a refutation rather than um, an affirmation of the kind of beliefs that he held. But just to show that, all right, you philosophers, you are claiming this thing, 
uh, but I'm going to write now to refute again to not I'm not is to just to show that the methods the arguments you use are infallible and not infallible I means uh, that was the idea mm -hmm. but uh, uh, to, to 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 express what he actually believed then we have to go to his other uh, his, his his other book uh, so you see I think this uh, it's important to, to 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 observe that and of course later on uh, he left uh, the Mizamia uh, University in Baghdad uh, to lead a Sufi life. You know, he left his, uh, his the Ghazali chair, uh, the, sorry, the chair of the Shafi'i chair, the Shafi'i chair uh, in, in, in in Baghdad, chair of Shafi'i law, and he became to, you know convinced that there were other ways. In other words, um, there were other paths to truth. Um, to, he appealed to supra rational experience. Uh, he became one one of the of, of the important uh, Sufis. Uh, in other words, uh, there was a lot of his books uh, which were written from the perspective of Sufism. The most important, of course, is uh, is the magnum opus, uh, is the uh, uh, which is a very important uh, Sufi ethics, a work of Sufi ethics. Uh, whereas Ibn uh, Rus was talking about um, uh, in a school of ethics, in a perspective on, on ethics, not Sufi ethics, but the ethics of the philosophers. Uh, and um, one can, one's, the, the, the kind of ethics that Ibn Rus was talking about, more the Aristotelian ethics, um, ethics based on the rational uh, investigation, rational approach, uh, whereas in the case of uh, Agazari is helping more to kind of um, the inner experience, the inner transformation. Uh, uh, the, to, to, to the people who are knowledgeable in the Imun Mukashafa, uh, the science of the uh, unveiling. So it's different way of um, experiencing truth. Uh, this is important because the Quran talks about three different kinds of certainty: certainty of knowledge in Muyakin, certainty of knowledge, then the in the uh, certainty of vision, which is the Ainu and Anu Yaqeen, and the other one is the Hakul Yaqeen, uh, in, in sense the, uh, the person who uh, became uh, spiritual acting, who can extinct uh, for an experienced state of fana uh, in God. So the Sufis were very, very interested in this kind of uh, uh, spiritual experience, which is maybe called super rational, without negating, without negating without rendering illegitimate what was uh, accepted uh, previously. So that's why uh, Agazali is saying to, to, to the Asquas, I mean, to the, the Mutakalimun, he, he criticized the, his fellow Mutakalimun themselves. I think, although I come from the same school, but there are things which I don't agree, uh, he said, uh, with regard to philosophy, because uh, uh, yes, there are things that he, he can accept from the philosophers, but there are many other things like logic, mathematics, uh, and so on. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. So why should uh, why, sh why should we reject that? Uh, with that kind of uh, attitude, Al Ghazali became, uh, in, in a sense, uh, to me, uh, one thing that we should remember about Al Ghazali is that uh, he created he created a synthesis, basically, a synthesis of uh, Kalam philosophy. Uh, and uh, Sufism. He created that synthesis uh, in his thought. So this <coughs> um, this kind of uh, synthesis to be found later uh, in, the, um, uh, for example, uh, in uh, Ibn Arabi. So coming back to this, uh, now we talk about similarities and and and, and differences between. The, uh, Al Ghazali and Ibn Rush, uh, we realize the uh, the importance each role each played uh, each, each, each of them played uh, in the history not only in the history of Islam but even so in the history of the West. <coughs> you know, in their time, uh, I'm talking about 11th century, see from 10th century, 10th century, 12th century, 13th century. Um, one way of showing that you, you are somebody, you are famous, uh, is uh, to see whether you have a Latin name. 
So if you have a really nice name, then you're going to be famous, you know? Uh, so that's why in the, in the rules, you know, the Averroes, the situation as Averroes, and of course the most uh, uh, influential, the most famous of the Muslim uh, uh, thinkers in the, in the Latin world. And even al ghazali also has a um, Latin nice name, al ghazal So both of them were known uh, to, 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 uh, to the West. Uh, but unfortunately, I think in the case, especially of Ibn Rush, he was misunderstood in the Latin West. So that's why the appreciation shown by uh, people in the West since then until, until modern times, not exactly correct. Um, I refer to the one person, um, I, I like very much the writing of this, uh, uh, Harry Wilson. Uh, Harry Wilson, who uh, a scholar of Kalam, basically, um, the modern scholar uh, about Kalam. Yeah, uh, he wrote many works, as I know, about about, uh, about, uh, about Kalam, and he talked about the uh, twice revealed Averroes. He said, "What he meant that uh, even Rus was misunderstood in twice in the West." What what was in what in, in, in what sense was he misunderstood? No, the first time he was misunderstood. Uh, but the, the first misunderstanding about Ibn Rus was then he believed according to this critic, or rather according to these people who were his fans, uh, that Ibn Rus believed in two truth theory, namely the truth of revelation and the truth of reason, the double truth theory that was known in the West. But uh, that's what Ibn Rush was perceived by uh, some people in the West. And through them, through their influence later, even a small number of modernized Muslims uh, who, 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 who thought, who gave the same kind of appreciation of uh, Ibn Rush. But it's not correct. You, you don't find in the writings of Ibn Rush the, this, this idea of two truth, two parallel truth. One, the truth of based on revelation and another truth based on reason. On the contrary, Ibn Rush believed in one truth, but there are two different ways of expressing this truth. One is through revelation, the other is reason. And, uh, Ibn Rush wrote a work, you know, the first uh, maqal fi ma bain al-hikmah wal sharia min al-tisal. That, 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 the, which has been translated, I think the, the, which has been translated literally means the unity of, uh, well, it has been translated amongst, uh, by some as the unity of religion, uh, at the region and philosophy. But we have to be careful again when we, when we use term, because um, when we use the word religion, the, the harmony of religion and philosophy, the unity of religion and philosophy, uh, we may give certain meanings to religion, certain meanings to philosophy, and then it could lead to misleading uh, conclusions. We should use the word used by Ibn Rush. What were the word words that he used uh, in, in Arabic? Well, the word used in Arabic, which was used as, which translated into English as religion, was Sharia. Now, it is important to realize that Sharia is not equal to religion. And furthermore, when you use the word religion, on the other hand, you do religion starting from English. That people start in, 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 to talk about well, what's the religion? It's talking about din. See, you see, it, it's both way. It's, it's, it's uh, both way. If you say from Arabic translated into English, so actually what was translated was a Sharia and translated into religion. You may agree or you may not agree with that, but the point is, we have two. Uh, we have another word for religion, which is din. Certainly, the word used by Evening rules was not din, 
but translated in English as religion. And the other one is, of course, philosophy. Ibn Rus did not use the word falsafa, but he used the word hikmah. Of course, in Islamic literature, both hikmah and falsafa have been translated into philosophy. But there is a subtle thing about this, because after Al Ghazali, especially, after Al Ghazali, especially, the word falsafa became less used compared to the word hikmah. Hikmah became a more widespread is, is the word uh, more uh, used more widely than hikmah. As commented by some 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 Muslims first, it showed it showed that you know it showed that somehow the the Islamic perspective of philosophy has become uh, more entrenched. So even at the level of terminology, you know, people do use the word philosophy, but hikmah to make it conform uh, to the Quranic usage uh, uh, of of the word. So. Whereas, talk, whereas Ibn Rush talk about the harmony between, uh, of course, he used the word uh, uh, the soul, uh, in other words, used to, uh, but, but used to harmony. But the translation from the sense that he talk about, um, he, he basically he talk about the unity of hikmah and sharia, whereas in the English translation, uh, where in English translation, uh, it, 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 it's talk about um, uh, it's talk about the, the the harmony between religion and uh, philosophy. You, you can see that huh? uh, where uh, at what point that um, differences or rather misunderstanding or misleading uh, consequences or the, 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 the different consequences can lead from purely the question of uh, 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 terminology. But the point is, in the case of uh, Ibn Rus, he did not talk about the truth of the Sharia and the truth of uh, philosophy. On the contrary, he talks about the the convergence, the unity of the two. Uh, that, that 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 that's important, and therefore the idea of his fans in the West, especially his fan club in the Latin world. I mean, Ibn Rus, Ibn Rus was so popular in the West; he had a fan club. Uh, among uh, uh, Western thinkers, you know, just like nowadays the uh, Muslims uh, fan club, it's not more, more fan club of singers and uh, football <laughs> rather than uh, fan club of thinkers uh, thinkers in the West, you know. Uh, but in, in in case of uh, at that time, in the Rus has a fan club. Uh, but then he was misunderstood. Yeah, they like him for the wrong reason. Mm. Western thinkers like him for the wrong reason, thinking that uh, uh, he really, you know, he was, he was really, uh, uh, he believed that uh, reason lead to different uh, kind of uh, truth, uh, not the same truth uh, with which uh, uh, we associate with uh, revelation. Um, and in the case of the, and the other thing is understanding about even the rules was that. Um, even in rules of anti-religion, because uh, of the three issues that he brought up, uh, that certainly the, the, the three points on which uh, even uh, uh, in which Al Ghazali raised the matter, that is uh, the, the three issues on which he charged uh, that the uh, kind of the, the, the philosophers uh, were dubbed as having uh, committed kufur uh, because belief in the eternity of the of the world, belief in the uh, that the question of God not knowing particulars, uh, the question of um, the, res the 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 resurrection of the of, of, of there were three issues uh, that were um, that saw that the, the, the theologians or Zali was uh, was encountered. But um, these are um, um, difficult issues. These are difficult issues, and but but in my own thing, I do I, I do not see because it is more there's some misunderstanding also. Uh, on the part of uh, um, Al Ghazali, yeah? uh, on the, what he thought the the, the philosophers uh, were saying uh, with regard to this uh, this uh, three issue, and when we have, we have to, I think for, for us um, now it is important uh, that um, when we want to 
uh, differentiate between the two, we need to go to the original sources, uh, the, the original sources of these scholars, not depending on second hand, uh, on second hand thing, uh, or second hand views. Because, uh, you know, this, this question, for example, uh, I think people parroting, people just you now um, defeating what uh, others have said uh, without any basis. Uh, on, on, on the one, with regard to Al Ghazali, they say Al Ghazali is to be accused, right? uh, is responsible for the decline uh, of science. And um, uh, people talk about a, sh a, a showdown between Al Ghazali uh, in Ibn Rus as if that um, they. Uh, no, uh, they met each other and they, they, they live at the same time. Uh, contemporaries, living contemporaries, but uh, that's, that's not the case. I mean, the, uh, they forgot that, you know, they forgot that Agazali uh, died in one 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 one, yeah. Uh, whereas uh, Ibn Rus was born only uh, in one one two six, right? Uh, later only then. So how can so one how can you see that uh, you know one scholar American scholar you know uh, who was of course very critical of Ghazali he said he, he mentioned the, the showdown the showdown between Al Ghazali and Ibn Rush. I thought the showdown for example you see the cowboy film the high noon no uh, no the the hero and the and the, the, the bad guy drawing pistol but this one. I, I mean, uh, Ibn Rush was not drawing pistol against uh, Ibn Rush because uh, Al Ghazali was already in the grave, no? <laughs> Ibn Rush, basically, because Ibn Rush is responding to Al Ghazali without Al Ghazali able to reply back. Possibly, if Al Ghazali is still alive, you have said, uh, no, if uh, he wrote the Tahfa al Farasifa, uh, Ibn Rush wrote Tahfut al Tahfut, so well, maybe he will, he will write another one Tahfut, Tahfut, Tahfut. <laughs> uh, uh, that's for the philosophers, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that was the case. So what happens that some people who try to interpret Al Ghazali, who want to interpret Ibn Rus, so it's their interpretation who make the difference between the two look, uh, you know, very, 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 very I mean, large, you know, uh, they kind of divided too, too far. Uh, I think. Uh, but that, uh, uh, that was not the case. Uh, certainly, I think uh, my own study of the history of Islamic science and Islam, uh, you'd be wrong to say that um, uh, Ghazali uh, that uh, knockout to, to, to science. And it's as if that science um, uh, was uh, demolished by Ghazali and never, uh, never uh, recovered or something. But that, that wasn't the case. Yeah? Uh, what was true was then. Philosophy took a new form mm -hmm. because of the critic of Al Ghazali of the of the peripatetic philosophy of the Mashai school. Philosophy in Islam took a different form. Uh, not on, of course, on the outside, as it just not terminology, turned to hikmah, but then um, philosophy was not just based on reason. But based also upon other other, other sources, uh, that is important to to uh, uh, to rely. Then the, um, uh, my my own study that I mean the, after Agassiz, um, in different branches of science, um, there was steady progress rather than decline, especially in astronomy. Um, I, if you refer to the works uh, of uh, George Sariba. An Arab Christian. He's not. Um, he's an Arab, but not a uh, uh, but not a Muslim. Uh, he's he's a leading scholar today uh, on Islamic astronomy. For him, the the golden age of Islamic astronomy was after Al Ghazali, for example, right? Uh, and my own study uh, of the uh, of the Qutub uh, al-Sirazi, for example. Uh, a scholar, a follower of Ibn Sina uh, in philosophy, uh, but uh, a great scientist. Um, and um, uh, he revived together with uh, Nasir Din Tusi, the science of optics. He revived then. In other words, uh, during that time, 
uh, the the uh, knowledge of physics and, and, and optics in, in particular. But what is to be noted is that that revival in the science of optics, uh, not for scientific reason, but more for philosophical reason, especially the, more for, uh, because of physics, of philosophy and uh, metaphysics, that led uh, to that. In other words, uh, based on the, 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 in other words, it was the burst of, uh, of of light in the Quran. For example, the the metaphysics of light that led to the uh, blossoming of the science of optics, not empirical consideration, but metaphysical uh, uh, consideration. So it's different uh, thing altogether. <clears throat> if if you are, if you are to believe what these critics of Agzali, then the then you won't find uh, that kind of uh, situation in the history of, uh, of Islam. So long after Al-Ghazali, science continued to be, to be cultivated. Uh, of course, it, it is not the same, maybe not the same, not all the same branches of science uh, as were to be found during the time of Al-Ghazali. But the point is that it is not true, that science kept declining, 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 due uh, to the knockout, uh, the philosophical knockout by Al-Ghazali. Uh, it, is, it is this kind of thing that I, I feel, and you know, to, to, I'd like to say, right? in other words, that um, um, for, Islamic, for, for, for Islamic thought, both the kind of thought that we associate with Ibn Rose, the kind of thought with Ibn Ghali, uh, not some not only possibility these are not possibilities but they um, correspond to the teachings of the quran in other words the quran talks about so many things and different minds are attracted to this different aspect of the quran this was my this was the message of my book the quranic picture of the universe. In other words, the Quran talks about the universe from so many different angles. It's as if that the Quran takes, um, if, the, if the Quran is a camera, it takes different pictures of, of, of the universe. So some scholars, some scientists prefer to study certain pictures, uh, neglecting the other pictures. Whereas another group of scientists you know, prefer to study and, uh, the, the other pictures. So the same thing is the question of the, the intellect, the relation of the intellect to revelation, for example. There are many different ways of looking at the relationship between revelation and reason. It's not just one way. So Al-Ghazali emphasized one way of looking at the relationship. Ibn Rush looks at another aspect of that relationship. Now, there are different ways of looking at the relationship between creator and creation. Again, this is the problem. The moment we use the word creator, this, but this is English word. This is English word. So misunderstandings can arise because we are using English words whose meanings do not really correspond to what the Quran is using. Because you see, when you see the word create, God create, God the creator, God the creator, and creation. Well, normally, most of the time, people use the word Khalik, Khalk. But again, if you look at the work of Al-Ghazali, for example, his book, The Divine Names, The, 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 the Beautiful Names, the, the Divine Names, then he will tell you there that Khalik, creator there, is depends only to different aspects of creation. Not creation from nothing, not creation from, uh, from uh, in a sense, from, from nothing as understood. Eh? Of course, philosophers and the Sufis understood nothing, that nothing, Adam as something doesn't mean nothing. Yeah, it doesn't mean nothing. Uh, but we, the, the creation ex nihilo uh, of the exoteric theologian who said that nothing, still the point is uh, the Quran does not use that word. Because there are other words the Quran uses to talk about creation, different aspects of creation. Bada, bada, yeah. You can, that's, 
it does not mean the same as uh, as uh, Khalaqa. Yeah? So Khalaqa refers to a process of creation on something which already exists that is transformed into uh, in, in, into another thing. So it is different. When I'm saying that there's a need to be careful uh, when we are speaking in English, we are discussing in English on concepts uh, that use in, in, in Arabic, which can mean and normally it means um, uh, different things, or it conveys a wider meaning uh, of words. So these are uh, the, 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 uh, what I'm trying to say. Okay, let me see. Uh, let me stop there so we can can uh, we can have some uh, some discussion on this. Uh, let me just um, say this. Um, then within the large universe of uh, of Islam, of Islamic thought, Islamic ideas. Um, both Al Ghazali and Ibn Rus were great thinkers. Um, Professor Said of Sinasar used the word universal figures. Um, these thinkers were the universal figures of Islam, meaning that they were knowledgeable in uh, many different fields of, uh, of, 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 of study, different fields of knowledge. That was, in other words, um, they were both. Uh, scholars of uh, they were philosophers they were scientists they were theologians uh, um, not just a few but uh, many of them so within this uh, universe or within this uh, interactive universe of islam uh, there are so many thinkers uh, whom we can uh, look upon uh, as um, expressing the many faceted the many facets of the truth of Islam. Islam is multi-faceted. Some scholars, different scholars, deal with different aspects of Islam, but there were things that combined them in some that united them, namely their belief. It is a certain belief united them. Uh, in, uh, they all believe in the uh, articles of faith. They all believe in the five pillars of Islam. But of course, when it comes to the interpretations of these uh, articles of faith and articles in particular of Islam, they are so many. They belong uh, to different schools of thought. So there is both unity and diversity. And that is the beauty of Islam, uh, that Islam uh, emphasizes unity in, in diversity from the one to the many and from the many back to the one. So thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, Jazakullah khair from uh, Osman. Alhamdulillah. Unity and diversity. And is no uh, showdown. And uh, Imam Ghazali and Ibn Rush live in two different times. So a lot of misconception. Alhamdulillah. We have good clarification and good uh, and we have a lot of questions too from the audience and um, and uh, Prof. Osman, we have uh, Dr. Omar Hassan Kasole from Uganda all the way. We also have the guest, uh, Tan Sri Ramli Ngahtalit from Pera or in Kuala Lumpur. And we have from uh, Cambodia and uh, from all over the world. We have 221 participants now around the world. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Yeah. Uh, Tan Sri, is, uh, yeah, you can. Uh, Tan Sri, you want to ask question? Maybe Shahran can unmute Tan Sri's uh, mic. Sharan, uh, maybe I can, uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, uh, unmute. Uh, Santri, can you unmute? Or oh, any anyone to ask question? Uh, please uh, unmute. Uh, or maybe. Uh, Hello. Yes, yes, Sam Sri, go ahead. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I just caught up with, uh, uh, because there was a bit uh, of uh, hazard at the beginning, so yeah. I missed about 15 minutes of uh, Professor's uh, um, talk just now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in the end, but, but I, I still uh, was able to catch up uh, one of the main themes of uh, Imam Ghazali, and that is... Um, uh, with him uh, and his uh, uh, 
uh, alleged confrontation with uh, Ivan Rose or Ivan Rushwood, Rush. and uh, Ivan Sena. It's true that uh, that these critics uh, look as if uh, uh, regarded as if all these three or four other philosophers, philosophers including, um, of course, uh, Al Ghazali, uh, were living at the same time. Um, I was also taken aback by, by by these allegations, and when when I searched further, I really found that uh, they were they were decades apart, and uh, it was not possible for them to uh, to confront each other um, during each other's time uh, when each other was was living. <clears throat> so on the, one of the main um, aspect that uh, people. And uh, intellects, intellectuals, some philosophers, I think especially from the West, um, came out with, uh, with that uh, with Imam Ghazali, the uh, the science floundered, and then he was more uh, concerned with revelation, more concerned with uh, uh, with the domestic affairs, uh, with more, uh, more concerned with. Uh, the domestic affairs of Muslims, rather than uh, uh, higher uh, ethics and uh, philosophy, um, and this is this is this seems to be the, the theme of attack, uh, the core of attack by Western philosophers toward Imam Ghazali, and um, what I I, um, I was about, in fact, I was trying to uh, to ask. Uh, this question, uh, this aspect of uh, Ghazali's uh, philosophy, um, but since it was now it was just now explained by the professor, Professor Osman, then I'm quite satisfied about it. So that that actually is my my comment on this matter at the moment. Thank you, Tansri. Uh, Prof. Osman, you have any comment on that? Well, oh, thank you, Tansri. <clears throat> In fact, the, the, an easy way to refute uh, those who make the allegation uh, is for them to read Ghazali's book, uh, Munkit Mina Dola, which is available uh, in both English and Malay, uh, in English called Deliverance from, uh, from Era. It is clear that uh, from that book, uh, Ghazali is, was having quarrel with the philosophers only in the area of metaphysics. He was not quarreled with scientists, uh, with, with, with the philosophers on the question of the physical sciences, on the mathematical sciences. No, not on those. So when we say science, normally we refer to these two, mathematics and the physical sciences. Physical sciences. These two groups cover what we today understand as science. But he was concerned with the philosopher's claim that they were able to establish the, 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 their thesis, their certain beliefs uh, through the use of logic and reason. He was scoring with that, for example, the question to show the eternity of the world that not So it's a different kind of thing. It's not with science. And therefore now to charge al Ghazali that is possible to science is to miss that point, yeah. So it's just just that, even if you want to be involved in this quarrel between Al Ghazali and Sapper, let's just concentrate on those issues that uh, that he was talking about, not anything else. But now people generalize to make Al Ghazali, you know, look really you know, the, the, the person who 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 is anti science. But that's not the case. He was not not anti science. He was not anti reason. He was critical of the position of the philosophers on certain issues. That's all. Okay. Okay, okay. Prof, I have two questions on chatting chat room. Uh, one from Samsul Idul Adha. Uh, the question is, if Ibn Rush is, is Ibn Rush a representative of Atari or textualized, textualized school in his theological doctrine, especially in the book Kash Minhaj Al Adila? And Al Qaid Ahl Al Milla. This is the first question, Tansri, Al Prof. And then uh, another question from 
Brother Nuruddin, uh, Prof. Prof. Uh, Osman, please explain more about Ibn Rushd's criticism to Muslim philosophers in general. He said that Ibn Rushd felt that the philosophers had made a mistake in understanding Aristotle because at that time Aristotle's idea had been mixed with other ideas. So one, so one of Ibn Rushd's important project is to purify Aristotle. This is another question. So I think two questions uh, for time being. Well, I mean, the, um, these are kind. Of, I mean, to, to, you have to understand when one philosopher criticizes another philosopher, or non-philosopher, but on very, very you know, uh, intellectual kind of issue, it's bound to be some some differences. I mean, the the points that you know. Uh, even he, you know, he, he used reason, basically the methods of proof, the uh, is manahij uh, al adila, you know. Uh, the question of this referring to the place and use of logic, mantic, and we must know that uh, Ibn Rus uh, was a great follower of Aristotle in the art of logic. Now, he considered himself as being true, truer than anybody else. In other words, um, he considered himself as the best of the Aristotelian. He was faithful to Aristotle more than anybody else. All right, I mean, there's no problem with that. If you want to, to, to make that, yeah. Uh, he, and if he believes that, you know, uh, he was, he, the Aristotle is really uh, the person whom he should uh, emulate, I think uh, as long as the things he, maintain are not contrary to the truth of Islam, there is, there is no problem uh, with that. Uh, what is important is generally speaking, not in detail, but in general, Aristotle was accepted uh, very widely in Islam as a Hakim, as a, one of the Hukama, one of the, or one of the sages, all right? Uh, so, uh, Plato, Aristotle, among, um, um, among the Greeks, were accepted by the Muslim philosophers, even by Al-Ghazali as theistic philosophers, meaning those who believe in God, those who believe in the last day, those even who believe in the, the divine laws, um, very much in the line with the, with, with the Quran, the idea that um, each prophet has been given uh, an Akida and uh, as uh, and, and as a law, a, a Sharia, different prophets, different different Sharia, and um, so it's, 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 it's not against Islam. Hmm. In other words, it is possible to, to to integrate the thinking, the thoughts of uh, Aristotle and uh, of course, but on details, uh, you don't have to follow him. And this is where, for example. The, the, the thing about the uh, Muslim philosophers and scientists, while they call themselves the follower of Aristotle, meaning broadly speaking, they were free to criticize him on many so on, on many shows, and that gave that 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 that, that led to the the new perspective on science. They were not merely followers of Aristotle; they criticized also Aristotle, even the Sina. He criticized Aristotle on many many on, on, on many things, while being still being in, being placed in the same. A school called the Aristotelian followers. Uh, the, the, uh, so among philosophers, they also criticize each other. Yeah. Uh, this, 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 this is normal. Uh, uh, it's normal among the among the intellectuals, among the thinkers, that they also criticize each other. So I think not to not to be worried about that. But the point is, what unite? Yeah, despite these differences. There were principles on which they all agreed. Different So, so the, the, I think the uh, there's been sense uh, no, that the difference, uh, the uh, differences of views among the ulama and among the scholars is, is, is a kind of blessing uh, to the, uh, the to the ummah. Okay. Uh, what was the, 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 the other question? Uh, the other question, well, I have to uh, slow, okay. The second question. Uh, the second question is from Nuruddin. Is, uh, 
to many questions. Yeah, it is. Uh, from from uh, Osman, please explain more about Ibn Rush criticism to Muslim philosophers in general. Oh, yeah, I already answered that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then. Uh, so I open to the floor now, uh, virtual floor. Uh, any question? Can you raise a hand? And Brother Shahram will unmute. Uh, Brother Sapi, Brother Sapi, uh, Brother Shahram, please uh, unmute. Uh, Brother Sapi. Uh, okay, sorry. Ah, uh, yes, Radhi. So go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Because this is a direct speaking to the top, Prof. Yeah. I haven't seen you for a long time. Yes. Pop KP. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Okay, Prof, my question is just this. Uh, uh, because I'm also interested in the sophistic uh, world. The, during the time of Al-Ghazali, which is about what, 1058 to 1111, yeah? yeah? That coincides also to the time of uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al-Jilani, who was considered the Sultan of Saints which is around 1078 to 1065. Was there ever any encounter between them and any engagement in terms of knowledge? And what did the philosophers, philosophers like Ibn Rush live later uh, say about uh, the knowledge, the sophistic knowledge of uh, Sheikh Abdul Ghazali? Do they ha have any sort of engagement at all? There Thank you, Brother Radhi. Rosman? Well, I... Have I studied I mean, the, the personal encounters between uh, no? um, what 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 was important uh, uh, was that uh, is more in, in terms of the history of ideas, uh, the kind of ideas that uh, the, the, of course I mean the Sufism has existed long before uh, before Al Ghazali even had uh, the kind of Sufism which involves. Uh, conceptualization, philosophization, the uh, the what what do you call it just now? We are no more interested. We are more interested to see what kinds of uh, personal encounters. Which I I I, I don't go into uh, into that. Uh, oh. No, into that. Uh, oh, maybe they don't contact each other, but the ideas. You know, was there any engagement in terms of what? Uh, let's say then the knowledge as brought by Sheikh Abu Qadani, he had a lot of followers, thousands of people he converted in Baghdad. Uh, so um, uh, there's got to be some sort of, even if it's not personal engagement, maybe some comments from the philosophers or Ibn Ghazali about that. Well, you're, you're talking, we're talking basically about the Sufi school, about Sufism. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I have two questions from a chat room. Uh, <laughs> And also, uh, two two person uh, already raised their hand. Uh, the uh, Alvin Lingam. So I'm going to uh, read the question in chat. Prosman from Ali Nur Kader. Uh, Prosman, what is your opinion on the difference between Islamic metaphysics and uh, modern metaphysics? This is from Doctor uh, Ali Nur. And from Prof Rosnani Hashim, did the Minha during Caliph Al Makmun resulted in the conflict with the rationalists? And after his death. And with the new Khalifa, the philosophers were persecuted as this a uh, consequence on philosophy in decline of science. There are two questions. Okay. Um, first, the uh, metaphysics. There's a, well, it, it depends, but generally speaking, because you talk about modern metaphysics, you know what I mean? Uh, there are certain modern, modern metaphysicians uh, who are very much alike to the traditional uh, metaphysician, but in general, uh, there is a difference of you know in terms of uh, certainly one difference is that um, Islamic metaphysics um, started. It, it, it talks about science, the science of God, and the words. Uh, the starting point of uh, Islamic metaphysics is the knowledge of the divine realities, knowledge of God. Uh, which also discussed in the uh, among philosophers, which uh, you know, uh, basically the important to, to observe is this: um, metaphysics is about the science of the uh, realities, which in theology, which is common to theology. Okay, theology is about the science of God. 
was the same thing as metaphysics, except that the metaphysics um, was uh, used more by, by, by the philosophers, where in the case of the, uh, the theology of God, let's say the theologians. So Islamic metaphysics was the kind, the, the brand of knowledge dealing with uh, divine realities um, according to the, the philosophers. Philosophers use that. So who, who talk about Islamic metaphysics? In the past, it was the philosophers. But then, the philosophers belong to different schools. After Al Ghazali, after Ibn, after Ibn Sina, earlier when she philosophy, falsafa, it means the the peripatetic or the followers of Aristotle. But after Al Ghazali's attack on falsafa on philosophy, a new schools of philosophy appeared. The immediate one, of course, the, the school belonging to Surawardi, the the school of the the Ishaqi school, the Indonesianists, and and of course, where they differ is in terms of their methodological approach yeah. to, to, to 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 metaphysics. But the principles of metaphysics discussed by the philosophers are the same principles which the theologians talk, which the Al Ghazali talks. All right. So it's just that different here in terms of terminology, in terms of, but in terms of the truth themselves, they are the same, one, one and the same. But they are called by different names and they are approached differently by the philosophers on one hand and by the theologians on, on the other. And um, this metaphysics has application to science, to physics, basically. Metaphysics has a very important implication for physics. But the, in the case of the modern understanding of metaphysics, it's basically more kind of just philosophy, just philosophy rather than metaphysics of the high of, 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 of the high order. They don't talk about uh, the, the Godhead, about the divine attributes. They don't talk about uh, the relationship between uh, the divine attributes and the world of many manifestation. Uh, so the word metaphysics used in mo modern context has lost its uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's ori original meaning. It's just another, it's, a, it's no different uh, uh, from uh, philosophy, really. Okay. Now, the other one, the question from Professor Rosnani, uh, that is about um, uh, the, the different uh, scenarios or different impacts uh, on philosophy as a result of the change of political power. Basically, that was that, Professor Rosnani. I think uh, uh, this was quite, uh, uh, it was, uh, in other words, uh, a regular thing. Uh, that's the future. Yeah? The, yeah. In other words, uh, patronization did influence uh, intellectual life uh, in Islam. So, in the case of, uh, you know, Ibn Rus himself, um, he was um, one uh, El Mansur, different, this is different El Mansur, this is uh, talking about Spain, about Islamic Spain, Spain and Andalusia. You know, uh, sometimes he was persecuted. Ibn, Ibn Rus, his books were, were burned, uh, you know, but then uh, he was later, you know, uh, you know in a sense, uh, uh, rehabilitated. Yeah? Uh, in the, he found uh, support uh, uh, again. This uh, is a lesson for us. It's a good for lesson for us that, in other words, the to, to see that the development of knowledge in Islam also depended on patronization, and uh, scholars um, uh, have seen the light of it because certain uh, you know good patronization, but at other time, uh, in, the, in the case of the the Mutazilite time, for example, some some uh, scholars were victimized, right? Uh, so that seems to look like to be to be to be the case. No, um, uh, the the intellectual life in Islam was uh, dependent uh, on the attitudes on the, the attitudes of the rulers uh, towards uh, knowledge. And of course, of course, in the case of philosophy, um, uh, they also suffered the challenge from the ordinary. No different from from the school of uh, uh, from the school of ulama who are against philosophy, for example, 
So in the case where the rulers have to get the support uh, of the ulama who are anti-philosophy, so philosophy has to take a second seat, as I say, uh, to the back, back seat, precisely uh, because they don't have the, have, have, the, have the support. So the fate of philosophy in the Islamic world has also uh, been decided by the uh, by by the people in power. Okay. Oh. Can uh, I can yeah, I just uh, yeah a short one for Prof. Rosemary? Go ahead. Clari- cl- make a cl- clarification. What I mean is that uh, during the Mena, uh, the Khalifa Al Ma'mun was on the side of the Mutazila. They were arguing about that uh, about Quran, the Quran as Mahluk, Remember, and then yeah. Imam Hamali was in prison and so on. All those were against the idea were in prison, but then after his death of Al Ma'mun, this new Khalifa now. The, takes a uh, side with uh, Imam Bali, Muhammad Imam Bali, and release him. And now they are persecuting the rationalists, the Mu'tazila. And the philosophers are belonging to that school. So they go into hiding, and that's why you have Ikwana Safa writing without the, uh, giving up their names because of fear of persecution. So I'm just wondering whether is that related to the persecution of the rationalists after that? And therefore, then the decline of the of the rational and empirical science. Okay. Well, I think uh, okay. I think it's very important uh, to to qualify the use of the word. Is I said, be careful. Is the word rationalist. I mean, uh, there's no uh, no one common uh, uh, understanding of this um, uh, rationalist. Okay, so, Mutazila then. <laughs> to put, Mutazila. No, you say you say rationalist. I'm not. Uh, are you referring to the the, the, the philosophers? Are you referring to the Mutazila? Mutazila. No, no they, they, they belong to it. The Mutazilas are not the same as 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 as, as the, the philosophers, although they have something co- in common, in common, but they are not identical in their views mm-hmm. uh, on, on, on many, many, uh, many issues. All right? Mm-hmm. Because the Mutazilas belong to, they belong to the school of Kalam, not Falsafa. Of course, the, the among the, uh, the people of Kala, the Muslims were the most rationalistic uh, of all, because he understands that they uh, put some to the point even of reason as above uh, above uh, revelation. revelation. <laughs> but not, not but not the philosophers. Yeah, so this is very careful. Rationalists, um, yeah, the, to to say that. Muslims like were rationalists, and the philosophers of this can be confusing uh, because the, here we have to look on what issue. Okay. Both, both, both emphasize the importance of reason, yes, but um, they have different kinds of beliefs. They, they uphold different doctrines. Uh, that is, it's not the same. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you. We, I think we're going to finish at 10 30, but we have uh, two, uh, or you waiting in the, to ask you a question. One from Alvin Lingam, another one from Nabil. I will ask the brother uh, Nabil, Alvin Lingam to ask question. You're from Indonesia? Where are you from, Alvin? I'm from Singapore. Oh, Singapore. Assalam- okay, Alvin, go ahead. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, Professor uh, Osman. Uh, attended your, mm-hmm. your session about one or two weeks ago. I have a more specific question. <clears throat> so basically, the whole scholarship on this, we're talking about why the Muslim world lean more towards religious orthodoxy as opposed to a position of rog- logic and rationality. So a lot of critique on, on you know, the, the, the how the Muslim world developed post-Ghazali. And then, of course, Ibn Rushd, in his book, Tahafut al-Falasifa, gives specific rebuttals on certain arguments by al-Ghazali in Tahafut al-Tahafut. So Imam al-Ghazali specifically, he gave the example of the cotton and the uh, burning of the cotton. He said, when you burn the cotton, uh, you know, you burn the cotton because of oxygen and fire, but Al-Ghazali said, in effect, the cause is God. Whereas Ibn Rush said, no, you know, you cannot say everything is attributed in this way to God because you have to give effect to reason. You know, and uh, this kind of arguments ultimately led into a situation where even the ulama start having debates about orthodox views on when is the sighting of Ramadan versus the purely scientific view where there's a conflict in the views, you see. So now, obviously, Imam Ghazali had no chance to rebut Ibn Rushd, Tahafut al-Falasifa, because he would have died by then. 
Ibnu Rushd uh, was 10, 11 something onwards. He he existed after Al Ghazali died, and there was no specific rebuttal to Tahafud Al Falasifa. Okay. Everyone is wondering how Imam Al Ghazali, if he were to rebut, whether there would have been a rebuttal. Your question, uh, Alvin. Uh, what's your questions? So the question is uh, specifically um, Ibn Rushd, uh, the development of the Islamic world. If they had actually followed Ibn Rushd, would it have been different? And are we okay. going more towards religious orthodoxy, or is that uh, is there a misconception here? Okay, thank you. And brother Nabil, uh, can you ask your question, Nabil? Go ahead. Assalamualaikum. Um, shukran Professor Usman for um, your presentation. It's much appreciated. You in Malaysia? Um, my, where are you I now? Am, I'm from South Africa, but my oh. asal is from Malaysia. My forefathers okay. are from there. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, has, did Ibn Rushd, um, did he embrace to some degree the the critique that Ghazali had of the peripatetic philosophers, in particular the misapplication of um, Aristotelian logic, and um, did even Rush um, was he just merely a commentator of um, Aristotle, or did he critically engage and attempt to synthesize within the Islamic tradition as well? Okay, thank you, Prof. Osman. I think uh, you can answer these two questions and can you conclude for the whole uh, entire uh, talk tonight? Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Brother uh, Alvin Lingam. Huh? Yes. Um, well, it's okay that um, um, the question the, uh, that um, Ghazali did not have a chance to reply uh, to Ibn Rus. Uh, why I say that? Uh, because the issues that were involved uh, are perennial issues in the sense that um, this kind of issues basically is a, um, a confrontation, if I may use the word a bit stronger, between two perspectives. Mm -hmm. The encounter between two different perspectives that are always to be found in the minds of uh, people at all times. In other words, it, it's not just a historical issue of the time. The issue between the two perspectives, one the perspective to which Al Ghazali belonged, that was the perspective, and the other one is the perspective that, uh, uh, which was uh, represented by uh, Ibn Rush. Right? What are these two different perspectives? The question of looking at causality, basically. Yeah? Causality, the relationship between cause and effect. It all goes to the Quran, that's it. Now, both Al Ghazali and Ibn Rus were trying to defend the truth of the Quran, but different truths in the Quran with regard to the divine names, divine attributes. Al Ghazali wanted to defend the principle of God being, being powerful. The attribute God is the all powerful. God's will is infinite. God has will to do anything as well. And the emphasis here is that if you look at the, the arguments by Al Ghazali, is that in the Tahafur, it's almost the idea of negating secondary causes in the name of the primary cause. Exactly wants to defend or rather to constitute to, to, to safeguard. The idea that God has power over all things. I think that is emphasized in the Quran. God has power of, over all things. God has, you know, so, and, and, and therefore, in the, in the instance there, the, the arguments of Aqzali, uh, because I want to emphasize the, um, the uh, primary cause, uh, negates or the absorbs the, the secondary causes. Uh, they got, uh, he, he does not want to give a kind of uh, and the role to secondary causes that exist in the nature of things. It is the nature of, in, in a new fire has a God-given nature, which is to heat, right? Fire heats. That is the nature given to, to fire. So when the Quran says, we regard when, when, when the, you know, the, the enemies of Abraham wanted to burn him, all right. What did God say? God said, "Oh fire, cool." Yeah. 
So God ordered the fire to cool. Why did God order the fire to cool? Meaning that the fire had heat. The nature of fire is heat. So I, and then that's why he gave that order. So the point, so Ibn Rus was right to say that fire had this nature of heating. All right. But Aghazali was not interested in that, was interested that the ultimate cause, because people, to, 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 to prevent people uh, from only thinking about secondary causes, forgetting about the ultimate cause. I, I think that was the, 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 the two yeah. perspective. Yeah. The other one, now the question from um, Nabil. Uh, yeah? Yeah, Nabil. Uh, Nabil. Uh, Nabil, huh? Yes. About the, uh, I'm not quite um, uh, really uh, the question. Uh, what 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 is this, uh, the Ibn Rush? Uh, uh, Nabil, can you ask? Uh, can you repeat your question? Just please, to be precise, the question. Uh, uh, what is the question? Yes, yeah, so I asked. Um, did Ibn Rush, to some degree, embrace Ghazali's critique of the peripatetic philosophers in their misapplication of Aristotelian logic? Well, uh, uh, Ibn Rush. Uh, if you look at uh, his uh, he was more interested uh, in the defending the perspective of science. All right. So from that aspect, he criticized uh, 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 Ghazali. But I'm not sure we now when you want to say that the Ibn Rush was appreciative of Al Ghazali. Uh, criticizing the uh, the peripatetic philosophers with respect to what? Can you give the example? It's not generally, but what, what was that? Nabil? Okay. You still there? Um, yes, I'm here. What was the specific example that Ibn Rush uh, appreciated Al Ghazali's critique of the peripatetic? Because remember um, that remember that Ibn Rush was one of the peripatetic. So then we say that, that there must be on some particular issue that um, uh, he found himself to be on the same side as Ghazali. Is that what you say? No, not necessarily. Because what I understand is in the Tahafut at Tahafut, yes. he's also critical of Ibn Sina's um, embrace of um, Aristot Aristotelian philosophy, that he wasn't fully embracing Aristotle because Ibn Rush, he, yeah. he, he was an Aristotelian in its true light. And in, in the same light, he also critiqued Ibn Sina because of his misapplication of Aristotelian logic. Yeah. And he was trying to or of defend Aristotelian logic to some extent? Well, in details, yes, in details. In other words, in, uh, in his commentaries on different uh, books of uh, logical rules of Sotter, uh, he, he has differed uh, with, uh, with um, uh, Ibn Sina, for example, uh, or, or Al-Farabi. So Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, for example, although they consider themselves as followers of Aristotle, they do not follow strictly the logic, uh, the, 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 the logics of Aristotle. Starting with Farabi, uh, Farabi was the first person to understand to depart uh, from uh, from that. Okay, thank you, for Osman. I think we come to the end. And before I uh, conclude, or uh, maybe I just close the meeting, I would like to invite again Professor Osman to say a few words in conclusion for the whole thing well uh, uh, thank you i just want to thank all of you and uh, uh, from different parts of the world who are listening to this um i think um, I, I just would like uh, to to uh, to invite you i mean to um, to this uh, thing which, uh, which is basically um that uh, we need a revival of uh, philosophy uh, in the contemporary world uh, i think um, we need to correct uh, the misunderstanding, misconception about philosophy, the role of philosophy. Uh, it is very important uh, to uh, to understand, to, 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 to agree with uh, uh, Ibn Rush yeah, that um, there is no conflict between uh, between religion and philosophy or between Sharia and philosophy. In fact, philosophy uh, would be uh, the thing, the, the, the kind of knowledge that will help um, 
us to understand the Quran better. In sense, yeah. So the Quran, the the, the the Quran will be better understood if we have philosophy. Without philosophy, um, our ummah uh, will be an, in 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 the um, in in a state in, in such a state that um, you will not be able to be creative in knowledge. I think the uh, the, the 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 positive place and role of philosophy in Islamic thought needs to be uh, the you know, revived needs to be uh, represented, of course, in the context of the modern uh, of the of the modern world, the contemporary world. Uh, philosophy can address the challenge of the new knowledge that came from the West, uh, for example. Without guidance from philosophy, the Muslims will always just depend on faith. Faith without knowledge will not save us. But knowledge without faith won't help either. So therefore, the unity of faith and knowledge, and that we presented by philosophy, uh, would help the Ummah out of the present situation. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum.